Carl? I was looking recently at producing open source software, and um, I don't want to say... The book, not, the not book. actually producing some open source software. Right, but right. Yeah. So uh, it's old enough that I don't want to say how old, but let's just say it's a classic. That's a very nice way to put it. Anyway. Well, no, people really refer to that uh, on all kinds of groups. I, I regularly see people bringing up that book as something to read next. But what has happened since the book has come out? How, how has producing open source software changed? Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, it's very flattering of you to refer to it as a classic. I do see it cited sometimes, and I, I want to keep it that way. Mm -hmm. and, and that means it has to be updated. Since, since it came out, which was roughly around the time of the Crimean War, <laughs> um, I have noticed, uh, an, I get bug reports on the book. Mm -hmm. um, not, you know, it's not, a bug in a book is not always a well-defined thing, but someone will write in saying, for example, this piece of advice in this little section here is, we don't really believe it in our project and we seem to be doing okay, are you sure about that? And what I noticed in the last few years was uh, an increase in the rate of feedback like mm -hmm. that. Uh, so one, one example that I use all the time because it's a very um, easy one to understand is, there's a little section in the book called Don't Have Conversations in the Bug Tracker, which, which basically is saying if somebody puts a comment in a bug ticket and you want to respond and maybe other people are going to join in, stop and move that conversation to the mailing list because the mailing list as a tool is better suited to that kind of conversation. Well, that mm -hmm. was actually only a technical point about bug trackers back in the, the mm -hmm. Crimean War, or, mm -hmm. or let's admit it, 2005 or so. Yeah. Um, and it's actually not true anymore. For example, the GitHub bug tracker uh, mm -hmm. is very well integrated with the, um, uh, first of all, with the repositories at GitHub, but also with email, so that you can be watching a bug and interacting it entirely through your email client if you want, but you can mm -hmm. also visit the tracker, and that makes it fairly suitable for most kinds of conversations. So that section really needs to make its advice a little more sophisticated. It's not about don't have conversations in the tracker or do, it's about make sure the tool you're having your conversations in is suited to that kind of conversation. Certainly, tools have changed a huge amount, and when the book came out, Git had barely probably been invented, and now Git is almost universal, and the White oh, House yeah. is using it, and so Yeah, forth. I mean, uh, it's, so it's almost embarrassing now. The initial advice, uh, the book, the mm -hmm. first edition of the book gave the advice, you should probably put your project in Subversion or CVS, mm -hmm. which, I mean, is laughable now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just should not choose CVS, and I say that with lots of love, having been a maintainer of CVS or a co-maintainer. Um, and for an open source project, Subversion even, which I'm one of the founding developers of, would not be my first choice. I think Subversion is a great tool. I still use it all the time and, and will for a long time, um, especially in, in sort of corporate enterprise environments. But for open source projects, Git or Mercurial is the right choice now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and probably Git at GitHub. And so the book now just takes that stance. It says, look, if you don't have a stronger opinion, just put your project in Git and put it on GitHub. And now here are some reasons why you might want to do something else if you really want to be fancy, but by default this is what you should do. Okay. And that requires an mm -hmm. update throughout the whole book. And what's really interesting is not what tool you use or whether you use mm -hmm. this mailing list software or this uh, version control, but how people react to each other online nowadays. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. I mean, human nature obviously hasn't changed, right? Mm -hmm. people, are, people are still people. They still engage in flame wars. They mm -hmm. still are more insulting to people they have not met face-to-face -face than to those they have. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all true. And those sections of the book that are about how to deal with rude people, how to deal with, um, with other sort of human-to-human -human situations are not changing very much. Uh, but the, the ways that the communications and collaboration tools uh, shape conversations and nudge people into one behavior or another, those have changed. Uh, when I initially, in fact, we'll do a little show and tell here. When I initially estimated how much work this rewrite uh, for edition two of the book mm -hmm. was going to take, I sort of skimmed the book and looked at the sections and th thought about what I knew needed to be updated. And then uh, I put up a Kickstarter campaign, which was generously funded by some backers. And then I went, printed out after I got the money, printed out a copy of the book, which is here. And you can just see, I mean, there's red ink all mm -hmm. over the place. The, I underestimated the task. I mean, yeah. it was, it's basically a complete rewrite except for a few sections. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. probably have grown yourself over these years. Yeah, I mean, my opinions yeah. about a few things have changed, and I, I think it's important in a book like this to, uh, to not reflect a committee consensus on how to run open source projects, but to have one, one person's uh, strong, hopefully educated, but, but certainly strongly held opinions about how to run projects, and then have pointers to uh, contrary opinions where needed. 
So there will be a place where I, I give a piece of advice about how to manage a mailing list. But there's, I heard from someone mm -hmm. who read the book saying, I think there's a different way to do it. And I will refer to their blog post in the book itself, saying, well, mm -hmm. you know, for another view on this, go read so-and-so's blog post. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we now have yeah. books with tentacles. Yeah, so there's, there is a lot more, um, my own opinions have changed, but also there are a lot more people out there talking about how to run open source projects, talking about the human and sort of cultural side. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to draw on those resources, um, you know, simply steal the material and use it mm -hmm. where, where possible, uh, or refer to it where either I disagree but think it's important or where there just isn't room. Do you think the average, uh, I don't know if you'd call them a community manager, we just had the Community Leadership Summit, mm -hmm. so I'm thinking about community managers, but if someone reads this book, do you expect that they should be more professional or more deeply involved in um, managing a community than maybe when the book first came out? Um, in other words, do I think that, that my average reader, if there's such a thing, is mm -hmm. more likely to be considering themselves as a community management professional? I think so, somewhere? yeah. Yeah, to a degree, although it's, um, that's certainly not the only audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's also, it's aimed at, at straight up open source developers who do not think of themselves as community managers, but who in effect always have to be doing some of that just to take part in a project. It's also aimed at uh, managers, that is project managers in corporations mm -hmm. and government agencies and stuff, um, who also don't think of themselves as community managers but have to at least understand what that job is like in order to make good decisions. I know in your day-to-day -day work you're helping organizations who hadn't known anything about the open source world to come in and decide to make free software. So. Yeah, no, it's tremendously educational. But this is the part of the interview where I get to say my company's name, which mm -hmm. is Open okay. Tech Open Tech Strategies LLC, OpenTechStrategies.com. Um, we we're having a blast, and business, mm -hmm. by the way, is booming. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, mostly not uh, for-profit private sector clients. We've had a few, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I'm always glad to have them. But most of our clients are government agencies, uh, and second after government agencies is nonprofits, and. You might think that it would be the for-profit world that would have the sort of biggest culture clash with open source and have mm -hmm. a hard time, you know, letting strangers contribute patches and things like that. Uh, but actually, no, the for-profit world does pretty well. The nonprofit world is kind of in second place mm -hmm. and way trailing back there in third mm -hmm. place. Government agencies have the, really the most uh, severe culture clash with how open source works because they're, they're desperately afraid of embarrassment for good reasons. Mm -hmm. They can't take risks in public because there's always an elected official at the top who stands to lose in that case. Um, and they're extremely budget conscious, much more than for-profit entities. And what sort of um, strategies can you use to get them into the fold? Well, so there's a selection bias at work. The, by the time a, a potential client has called us or, or we've been referred to them, they already know that they want help doing open source better. Mm -hmm. So for all the you know, gazillions of agencies out there who are not doing open source well but who don't know that they need help, I, mm -hmm. I don't ever talk to them. Mm -hmm. right? um, so the ones I see are already, you know, they already are interested in improving uh, on this, this point. And some of the advice we give them um, is mostly about improving the way they manage their contractors because the government agencies themselves are not writing the software. Mm -hmm. They're almost always contracting out to some uh, software development firm or a subdivision of some very giant company, Lockheed Martin, you know, Halliburton, mm -hmm. whatever it is, where the, there's a tremendous expertise in how to respond to government uh, requests for proposal, RFPs, mm -hmm. and in how to manage the bureaucracy of government contracting on the part of these private sector entities. <laughs> there is much less expertise in how to run an open source project. Mm -hmm. And so our advice to our client, which is the government agency, is all about how to drag their contractor on board with actually running an open source project out in the open, getting their own developers out on the public mailing list in the bug tracker, committing to the repository, using real commit messages, not just you know one line, fixed bug number blah, mm -hmm. where blah, that number refers to an internal ticketing system that nobody in the public can see, mm -hmm. stuff like that. One of the pieces of advice we give uh, increasingly often is for government agencies, or really anyone who's hired a contractor to write open source software, uh, is to budget in a third party deployment test. That is, if, if you've paid someone to develop something, <coughs> excuse me, that is supposed to be deployable by a third party that has only you know, average or reasonable skill in the art of deploying software of this nature, 
but doesn't have specialized knowledge the way that the contractor that wrote the software has, mm -hmm. then you can't expect the people writing the software to really write installation documentation and and um, installation and deployment procedures and data import procedures right out of the box that, that just get it right. That's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. They don't have any experience mm -hmm. doing that. That's never been a business requirement before. Mm -hmm. They're going to mess it up. Um, so one, one way to help is to, to work with them to, to help <coughs> shape the way they, they build the installation processes. Mm -hmm. The other way is to budget in for the, the uh, employer, the, the, the government agency, to bring in a third party firm whose job is solely to take the public sources using the public documentation mm -hmm. and try to stand the thing up and import the data mm -hmm. uh, or whatever the procedures are for getting an instance running with, with reasonable sample data or live data. And uh, as they do it, for them to file tickets for all the problems they have in the public tracker, mm -hmm. and that's their only way to communicate with the, the actual contractors who wrote the software. Mm -hmm. So basically, you make passing that test be part of the contract. You know, if your software yeah. if your software can't really be deployed by someone who is not you and not us, mm -hmm. then it's not really effectively open source yet, no matter what the license says. Mm -hmm. um, but getting that getting all parties to understand that that's actually budgeted in, it's part of the process. There is a stage at which it happens, and it is not it's not right before the press conference. It's months before that, if possible. So. I know that's that some hard. governments um, adopt software from other places. There's Code for America, and we've talked mm. about that in other places. Thumbs up on them. They're doing mm -hmm. great stuff. <laughs> but uh, have you seen it being successful that a government agency will produce or contract to produce mm -hmm. software, and then other government agencies can also use it? Uh, let's just say I'm optimistic that some <laughs> of the projects we're currently working on mm -hmm. will reach that stage. Um, uh, we're working with... Um, the New York City Controller's Office mm -hmm. on a project called Checkbook NYC. Uh, the Controller's Office and I have to say the contractor have both been responsive mm -hmm. um, and they are, they've really moved into doing open source development um, increasingly seriously and I expect to see third party deployments of Checkbook NYC you know, within the next year or so. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. want to you know, publicly put pressure on anyone but I, mm -hmm. maybe if I say that out there that mm -hmm. will uh, you know, the, the magic open source fairy godmother will listen and make it happen. Well, that will certainly change the business model of the contractors when they can't sell the same thing over and over again well, to a hundred different... that's a very good point. Yeah. It is, yeah, in some ways these things are <laughs> counter to their interests, but if that's what the client is asking for and the only way to get the business is to actually deliver that, then, then their business model is going to have to change a little bit. Yes, well... And that's, that's fine with me. <laughs> Yes, well, we've got to get the public used to expecting more open source from uh, all their institutions, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, it's astonishing to me that it's even a hard sell in some places mm -hmm. because, I mean, after all, you and I already paid for the software or, mm -hmm. or you know, the, the constituents in whatever jurisdiction pays those tax dollars paid for that software. So there's just no reason why they shouldn't have full access to it under an open source license there's just no reason for there to be a monopoly. It's a public good. Sure. Um, and although that may sound sort of, you know, do good or idealistic uh, in a way that's not compatible with, with the real world of government contracting, in fact, at least the government agencies I talk to, actually, they really believe that philosophy. I don't run into, I don't run into cynical civil servants. I mostly talk to people mm -hmm. who actually believe that and want to make it happen. And just like the um, open publishing uh, movement, uh, open access to journals and open mm -hmm. data, I think um, we'll see more and more open source. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think there are a lot of business models that are perfectly compatible with that. I mean, one thing I always have to say uh, more often to the contractors and to the parties around them than to the governments themselves is open source is in no way anti-commercial, nor, mm -hmm. nor is free software, which I consider completely synonymous with mm -hmm. open source. Um, it is anti-monopoly. And if your business model depends on monopoly powers, you're going to have a problem. Mm -hmm. But if your business model depends on selling, for example, services and custom development and delivering, delivering goods for which you are paid each time you, you do the work, mm -hmm. um, then that's completely compatible with open source. And in fact, open source should be an advantage in many ways. Not, not just in that you can sell to people and, and convince them that they're not being locked into you, mm -hmm. but it's a hiring pool for your company. You know, uh, third parties contribute code and you see who's good and you can hire them. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of advantages, culturally as, as well as economically. Great. 
Thank so. you. Thank you for coming in. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. It's a pleasure.